the mimetic view of the apocalypse. Of course, the mimetic view is very American in a way because it wants to, to deal with realities, not with philosophical concepts, with things that work, that function, that operate, and social aspects in particular. And I think we can talk about uh, the apocalyptic text, Christian eschatology, in very concrete terms. So I go back to the, the aspects of the theory that are relevant, I think, to the definition of uh, eschatological or apocalyptic uh, part of the gospel. According to the mimetic desire theory, human conflict is not due to the fact that people are hostile to each other, but in a way that they are too friendly, that as soon as we admire someone, or even are close to someone, we tend to desire the same things because we imitate each other. Desire is not an instinct. We must not confuse desire with appetite. When we want to eat uh, and we haven't eaten, you know, it's uh, a biological need and you cannot replace the bread by a stone. Even a jewel, a very expensive jewel. You need bread. But desire is very different. There are no biological desires. I think that might be the difference between needs and desire. Desire is our choice. How do we choose objects? If the theory of the numeric desire is true, we choose desire through our friends. And it's not scandalous at all. This is excellent because we all want to be individualist in this world. Uh, it is a shame, in a way, not to be oneself. Say, I want to be myself. I have my desires, and they are my own. It's never true. They are always the desires which are popular at that time. <laughs> and if you look at history, you will see that history, from the point of view of clothes, from the point of view of entertainment, from the point of view of private life, is dominated by something today we call fashion. What does it mean? Why do people <coughs> in the 16th century want to have shoes that ended in a point which at some points were so long that you have to have something to hold it to your belt because you couldn't walk with it? So stupid it was. You think that stupid fashions are monopoly, but they existed already in the 15th century. Only pretty wealthy people who are not very numerous could afford to follow them. But fashion means that uh, desire is enough, period. Fashion is okay, because if you want to have these long pointed shoes, there will be people who immediately are going to make them and try to sell them to you, and that's perfectly healthy. And this type of competition is positive in some ways. Maybe not as positive as many Americans would like to believe, but nevertheless, it doesn't necessarily end in conflict, because mass productions, as you all desire the same thing, will give it to you. And uh, usually fashion lasts for quite a while. When it ends, you never know. Because fashions disappear silently. They do, especially with intellectuals, you know. With intellectuals, a philosopher, a thinker is extremely popular. And suddenly, you don't hear anything about him anymore. You don't even hear anything about the fact that he's disappeared as suddenly as he appeared. And this is due to the fact that uh, mimetic desire, we don't like to uh, publicize. <coughs> So, if the object is unique, if my friend falls in love with a girl and we are very friendly, 
what's going to happen? We're you going to fight? Ah, that one. So if you really look at the work of Shakespeare, you will see that more than half of the plays of Shakespeare begin with that scene on the Friday, right? And uh, certain of the plays, like The Winter Day, for instance, are exemplary in that fashion. It's at the end of Shakespeare's career, and he purposefully, I think, writes again the story which he has already written 15 times in a way that people will not recognize, but which he formulates the rationale of it very easily. We are friends, therefore, we have the same days, and we fall in love with the same earth. We are the best friends, therefore, we are the best enemies. The tragedy of life is right there, because uh, the more we like each other, the more we like the same thing. Therefore, the more we are going to fight, and both of us are going to feel betrayed by our friends. And this is the basic plot of uh, fiction, tragedy, the theater in uh, history, not in Western writing only, but in the find it in the far extent in uh, other places. So, how can, they, how can there be communities? Yeah. When communities form, the danger of mimetic desire is extremely great. But since it's mimetic, you know, we unite with our friends on an object of desire, and we fight. But when we start having enemies because of mimetic desire, the mimetic juice, if my might say, might work exactly in the same way, but ultimately unite us against this single thing in a very false, but extremely useful way. And science does not want to recognize that. The science of man, if you utter the word scapegoat, they get mad immediately. There is a great anthropologist at the beginning of the 20th century who used the word scapegoat, you know, and uh, usually everybody knows. He's one of the most famous anthropologists, but he's totally out of fashion because his work, in a way, in my view, if it were continued uh, systematically, would lead to the domain field. His name was Fraser. He was English, you know. And, uh, his book, The Golden Bar, is one of the few books of anthropology which is still in a great deal of form because it's not for people very long. He's still sold, or was still sold at you. So I became interested in anthropology because of him. But he did not pursue. You see, he was convinced that scapegoating, scapegoat, was reserved was something which was practiced only by archaic people, by primitive. So today he's very unpopular because he's not politically correct. He's against archaic culture. And we are right to agree that it is wrong to say that only archaic cultures are sacred. But they have something very special that we don't have. And he gave the name to it. They have scapegoat rituals. He invented the expression scapegoat rituals that many, probably most, I, I would even say all archaic communities, archaic tribes and so forth, have scapegoats that replace the enemies that would be in your family, in your friends and so forth. Sacrifice is a substitute violence. That's why a sacrificial victim must look like the people in the community. Because you're trying to shift the violence into the direction of uh, the substitute. In order to prevent 
the people from the culture to be hurt by archaic societies all about sacrifices. And sacrifices are repetitions and imitations of an original state building that has reunited, I go very fast, reunited the community and uh, made it one against the scapegoat. When the scapegoat dies, is killed, and the community is reconciled, he becomes an ambivalent god. He's both bad and good. But archaic gods are always guilty of something. They are never, if you look, even the Olympian gods in Greece, they all have scoundrels. Really. They are very old gods, so the bad elements has disappeared and they don't really play a role. Ah, uh, sacrificial gods have to be renewed from time to time. Because when sacrifices become too old, they lose their power. So the scandalous aspect of my thesis is to see that man's needs, man need a substitute violence in order to get along together. If you look at the place in Fortress, the moments when sacrifices are performed, it's always in difficult circumstances where there is a possibility of a big trouble between two families because there is a marriage and dangerous institutions are surrounded by sacrifices. You multiply them in order to avoid, to avoid the violence that uh, could be uh, produced. <clears throat> so a God fundamentally is a divinized scapegoat. This is very important because what people don't understand about the problem, especially Christian, about the problem of the similarities and differences between Christianity and men, is that Christianity has exactly the same structure as men. That is why anthropologists are right to say that. I think that conclusion is wrong. That conclusion is Christianity is a myth by all, all the others. You have a crisis, a scapegoat finally shows up and reconciles the community. <coughs> he's both very bad, we must kill him, but he's very good since after killing him, we've reconciled. I think the mystery of sacrifice is nothing but that. The idea that archaic institutions are insignificant, that they play no role, that they are just, you know, a stupid story. The 19th century view of religion, like uh, my fellow countryman Auguste Comte, said there were three stages of religion. And the first one was most stupid, and three stages of knowledge. Because he attributed, in a way, religion to curiosity, to the solution of the mysteries of the universe, which 19th century science solves all of them, <coughs> with no problem at all. <laughs> in between, there is philosophy which is bad because it has still aspects of religion, but which is getting to be better because it turns towards science. But he had total contempt for religion. We cannot do that anymore, especially if we believe in the theory of evolution. Because we know for sure that there were already religions where the magnificent uh, drawings of the Paleolithic caves in Lascaux and places like that were produced. And we know, or we suspect, if we, uh, that they are the product of religion. In Neolithic painting, because you have in places like Shatai, Huyut, in Tur Turkey and so forth, you already have sacrifices which are represented in painting. And where you see that uh, for reasons that the victims are substitutes for uh, scapegoats. 
They had to be close and they had to be far. They had to resemble the community. But sacrifice is how can we spare the community? And we have to have these uh, substitute victims. But a religion functions as long as it does not understand that this is what it is really doing. Yeah, that's why, nevertheless, the archaic religions are all mortal. Because there comes a point when sacrifices are no longer useful. And most uh, anthropologists, you know, in the late 19th and early 20th century, <coughs> this, they found religions, the religions they discovered, when they discovered the remaining archaic religion, in a state of disintegration. They found them in a state of disintegration because uh, these societies knew already too much about the other world, the civilized world, to believe in their own religion, even when they still pursue. But the idea that religion is a farce, you know, and that religion means nothing, is today incompatible with the theory of evolution. The theory of evolution will know that an institution which begins, we don't know because we can actually, but as far back as we go, and in a way more, more and more anthropologists <coughs> acknowledge the fact that uh, probably at the time of last school and so forth, 13, 40,000 years ago, there were already religions. And I think we can be pretty sure that sacrifice was the main object of this religion. In other words, religions are what saves us from our own body. This, I think, is very important in order to understand Christianity. Because if you look at all these mythical religions, they always begin with a community in crisis, and then they find the culprit. The culprit has done something extremely abominable. And we must get rid of it. And we all believe it, and we destroy the culprit, and then the culprit becomes a god. The most famous of all our men here which Freud believed said a mortal thing about the human condition is a story of his time. Why do the Thebans, all Greek mythology is in the Theban mythology, but Oedipus has been chosen as the victim. And, and there were signs, there are many signs in him that he's a very good sacrificial victim. He's not like the other ones. He solved a riddle and he's been made king of the community. He lives. If you look at the myth in general, you know, it looks like a bunch of people. Some of them limp, some of them uh, are one eye, like both eyes. Blind, like uh, Theresians. They all have some kind of infirmity. And we know, if we know something about uh, sociology, why this is. When a mob is curious, it looks for a victim. If it doesn't have any victim outside of itself, it will choose one of its own who suddenly the discover is no longer part of the mob. But there must be some sign, you know, that can work for everybody, some very simple sign. And very often it's a physical sign, like limping, like one eye, and other infirmities. That's the way human beings are, so they are not so far from animals at that stage. We tend also to kill the malformed, you know, other people 
have some kind of uh, problem, or even uh, predators kill the, the animals which don't run as fast as the other ones, we say. And it's the same thing. It has something in the bunch of zebras. There is one that doesn't look exactly like the other one. It is it will be the red headache. So, you know, in a way, the Christian religion reveals what I'm talking about, reveals the abomination of sacrifice, reveals that Jesus, because he's better than other people, because he's different, we don't know, but for no valid reason. He sprang into what we call escape. A single man who is singled out by his whole community and turned into a victim. Therefore, Christianity looks enormously like a myth. That is the reason the first man who saw that was a man named Celsus. You know, uh, who lived in the second a Roman who lived in the second century after Christ, and when Origen, a little later in the third century, <coughs> wrote a book in praise of Christianity, it's called Contra Celsus, against Celsus. And the reasoning of Celsus was already the reasoning of modern anthropologists, was that Christianity, look how it is. It is one of these characters who is selected as a victim and turned into a god. Like Isis, Osiris, uh, or all our gods. So, this Celsus was very profound in a way, since he, he was the first one to formulate in three sentences the modern theory about religion, which is all religion is mythical, including Christianity, especially Christianity, because it has exactly the same structure as myth. So what is the difference between Christianity and myth? It's so simple that most people don't see it, but it's obvious. Whereas myth will tell you that Oedipus is guilty, and Freud reinforced the mythical aspect of the men by saying, yes, yes, all men commit parasite and incest in their thinking, like Oedipus. He tried to turn it into an eternal truth, in other words, to create another religion. I think psychoanalysis is the best substitute we have today for a religion, a false religion, because it's just not true that Christianity is the same thing. It's so much different and the difference is so simple that we don't see it. Myth tell you that the victim is guilty. Christianity tell you the victim is innocent. In other words, from the anthropological point of view, which I think is very important in Christianity, we talk about the incarnation. We see that God is man as well as God. Therefore, we should not have only a theology of Christianity. We should have an anthropology of Christianity. Because if we don't have an anthropo-theology of Christianity, we are not talking about Christianity. We are talking about myths. And people are turned off by theology because all theology, which is only theology, is not really Christian. It's Augustinian, it's Thomistic, and so forth. But it misses the main thing of uh, Christianity, which is that Christ is a victim just like the other victims of mythology. But instead of telling us that the victim is guilty, Christianity says the victim is innocent. Therefore, we don't believe in myth anymore. Not because we are more intelligent, <coughs> but even though we don't fully understand Christianity, Christianity 
undermine some power. And I hope that uh, we are finally going to be able to formulate the reason why it undermines. It really does because it shows the basic innocence of the victim. In other words, the Christian text should be applied and put underneath all mythology. This is precisely the rebellion against Christianity, which turns psychoanalysis and similar beliefs based on mythology, because uh, we, our culture hates Christianity, we cannot stand it, cannot suffer it and uh, fights it whenever it can, with whatever means and so forth. And Christianity indeed is very close to mythology. But it says the truth about all mythology, which is that mythology is wrong and accuses a scapegoat. All the reading of Freud, of the Eadicus, Men are the opposite. Try to tell you it's in a way the true religion. It tells us the truth about man. Every little child wants to kill his father and marry his mother. It's not true. It's just a ridiculous lie. You know, which has turned the whole 20th century, I think, has immobilized it on a new powerful man. And uh, we are coming to the end. So that is the reason we don't have any sacrifices anymore, at least officially. And we don't have any prohibitions anymore. The archaic religions are mortal, but their death reproduces the condition of their rebirth. Because you have such a crisis that it will normally, it, will, it can end only with a single victim or a group of victims that can be considered as, as one, and can be both turned into the devil and uh, a kind of God. So, if what I say about religion, this religion is true, it means that periodically, when they lose their power, they have to be reborn. And they are reborn out of the crisis that their very decadence produces. As long as sacrifices are efficient, the society functions correctly. When sacrifices are no longer believed, no longer frightened the people who perform them, this society is in danger. It's going back into a crisis like the previous one, which will recreate an archaic religion. But is this happening in our world? No, not anymore. Because even though we don't fully understand Christianity, we understand it enough not to fall for that. And we don't have scapegoats par powerful enough to create archaic gods. We try all the time, but we fail. In other words, we have the bad aspect of Christianity because it deprives us of the archaic religion, which is really our dream. But it does not take us completely in the Christian area. We are in between. Therefore, we are in a constant crisis, which is very fertile and fecund, you know, which produces our, our endless society, because our society has been going on for close to 1,500 years now. Probably archaic societies. I have no reason to know, but it certainly don't last that long. 
But we cannot renew our religion. Because our only religion, if we accepted it, would be Christianity. Therefore, we are in a state of uh, disequilibrium, which prevents us from complete conflict, but we are fully aware that our society is getting less and less organized because the principles on which it was built, which were still largely unchristian, like jails, like, uh, you know, punishment, the necessity of punishment. We are all convinced of the necessity of punishment, and we are right, because people not being Christian need to be punished in order not to do so. At the same time, we are hampered in re-establishing a really functional system because we are too Christian. So we are in between. Therefore, our, our society is kind of coasting along you know, with partial crisis that can be more or less intense. But it is never undone. It goes on and on and on. And I think that in order to understand the uh, apocalyptic text, this is what we have to understand. If our society cannot renew itself in a primitive way, and if I cannot become fully Christian, because it's just too difficult. Because we cannot do it. It's coasting along more and more and more and more, you know. Now, to my view, the greatest apocalyptic text <coughs> are the apocalyptic texts in the Gospels. Because the Gospels is the center of the Christianity. And we should talk in detail the Apocalypse of John, John's Revelation. It's a great text, but it's a very late text. It is the text of the New Testament that was closest to not being accepted as canonical. It was really very close to being rejected as not authorized. Because the Apocalypse of John is really a pattern, very beautifully, I thought, really, it's a great text, and it's worth all the attention to it. But on much earlier texts, the first great apocalyptic writer is the most, the writer whose texts are the most ancient in the New Testament. And this author is Paul. The oldest letters of Paul are the two letters to the Thessalonians. And we think that the first one was written in 50. And the second one, the, on the first one, specialists think that it's at least uh, maybe 70 chances of 100 that it is by Paul. The second one, they are not so sure. Many people would, uh, would say it's not by Paul. But this is not very important. Because the, the letters of Paul, which are not attributed to Paul today, it doesn't mean they are not Paulinians. It means that they were written by students and friends of Paul, you know, and presented as Pauline. Not because it was a forgery, but because in those days it was a spiritual orgy which was important. And certain disciples of Paul felt that it was legitimate for them to present their form as the form of Paul. Now, the first letter to the Thessalonians is there is something comical about it, but in a nice way. I don't say that. It is Paul who is trying to prevent the apocalyptic enthusiasm of the Thess Thessalonians. Paul has been preaching the Thessalonians 
And this spring, you know, Thessalonica today is the first city you encounter still today, I think, maybe. When you're crossing from uh, Asia to Europe, you know, at the uh, Garden Mills, at the And it was indeed this fall stop in Thessalonica. It was extremely successful with this people. So it's a first Christian text because it was written about 50. In other words, before the Gospels. And uh, the Thessalonians were so happy about the news of the second coming of Christ that they felt it would be the next minute. And they were delighted because it meant they would be the only humans who would not suffer a human death. They would still be alive and go to heaven before they had come to God. So in the first half, uh, Paul is trying to quiet that, say, you, you misunderstood me, you know, and, uh, but that letter is so, I mean, many people use it against the whole idea of uh, the apocalyptic text. But the first Christian was so enthusiastic about the conversion that they wanted the end of times to be as quickly as possible. So not only they didn't fear the apocalypse, but they wanted to Paul to complain, say, the way you talk to us, and you should already have happened. And two people are able to have died in our community. So they are not part of the deal. And what's wrong with them? So, Paul answers that he doesn't know about the second coming, you know, and that they shouldn't act that way. But uh, there is no fear at the time. Not that Paul had not said that it would be. Paul had already said that it would be accompanied by great disruptions and so forth. But it didn't matter. The main thing they saw is that they would still be alive. And they would avoid the human death, which may well be the most profound desire of all of us human beings. And the second letter to the Thessalonians is the result of a letter from the Thessalonians to Paul, which was probably arguing with him about uh, his arguments. And one of the, the answer of Paul, if Paul wrote a letter of some Corinthian writer, is that first there must come the great disorder that we have received, that human culture will collapse. So it's a first really apocalyptic text. And it's a text about the Antichrist who talks about, who says that the state of society will be anomia. Anomia from A privately and no more the law will be a state in which there is no law. Anomia. Curiously, the first great French sociologist, Emile Durkheim, in his description of the novel, modern world in the early 20th century, I don't know if he was aware of it. He used the word anomie in French, which is a translation of anomia, direct translation of anomia in Greek. So he didn't realize he was repeating the same gesture as Paul, exactly the same. So what is going to happen to the world if you have no restoration of attributive culture, and if it's a bad to become Christian. It will coast along endlessly with this culture getting worse and worse. And if you really look at the apocalyptic texts, which I think are the most important, which are the ones in the Gospels, they are the most authoritative. And they precede, of course, uh, the apocalypse John by a century and a half. What they say is that uh, I was coming out and then 
What's it? What they see? What did they describe? They are the first ones, the Gospels, to have apocalyptic texts. So the great apocalyptic texts are chapter 24 of Matthew, chapter 13 of Mark, and they are exactly alike. And then the third synoptic gospel, uh, Luke. Luke has the same text, but they are dispersed here and there. But Matthew and Mark are exactly the same. And what do they say, these texts? They don't say that the apocalypse will be a brief period. They say, if these days had not been abridged, no one would have been saved. There won't be any faith anymore. And discord among people will be dreadful. Then there are more and more phenomena which are presented in a very minute way because it's always doubles. City against city. There will be many wars and rumors that rumors of a war always makes me think of TV. We are in a world in which rumors of war are even more scary. No, they are not more scary. Than wars themselves. But before our world, the world of so-called information, it was possible to wonder why the Gospels would find it necessary to talk about wars and rumors of war. We live constantly in a climate of war today, because if we don't have any real war, we have even more rumors of war than when we have real war. When we have real wars, governments try to stop this conversation about war as much as possible. But rumors of war are very important. So if you read the few sentences there, the application to our world is absolutely incredible. This uh, their power. Matthew 24 and Mark 13 are almost exactly alike. And they do not describe a situation which is uh, totally dehumanized. But in a way, a state of constant semi-crisis, which is moving toward a total crisis in the end, but after obviously a long period, which God will be kind enough to abridge for us. Otherwise, not one man would be saved. The power of the anti-Christian ideas will become more and more powerful all the time and therefore will uh, dominate this period. So these texts today are incredibly realistic, quote unquote. But they are not very lyrical because they are only a few lines. And I really think that what they are talking about is the lack of that central figure that would become the new that we will all be against so much that we will be reconciled against. We are trying to do that with Christ, everybody to be against Christ. And this is what our culture is. But it's obviously failing. It is partly successful, but on the whole, it will fail. Question. The Christian revelation is not going to be forgotten. Therefore, the Christian revelation prevents us from returning to archaic religion. Many people advocate that because ultimately, if you look at Nietzsche closely, this is what he complains about 2,000 years and not one new, new God. <laughs> and what he's looking for. Is a new God that would start a new. If you really look at uh, Nietzsche, his idea is a return to archaic religion. But uh, he failed. 
que a só que a tocar e 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 que a toc